All right. Today is Wednesday, December 15th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and we have a lot to discuss. So let's dive right into it. In focus tonight. How about decoding the dove? Or shall we say the hawk? You're not sure, are you? Well, I am, and I'm going to decode him for you, step by step. But before we start, remember what our expectations were ahead of the FOMC meeting. The consensus was the Fed will announce tapering everything today. And the reason is we got the hot CPI and the even hotter PPI. Certain expectations went further by saying perhaps Powell will announce raising interest rates as soon as this meeting. I thought it was a long shot, but this is how far we went in our expectations. You got to keep that in mind. On top of that, the consensus was the Fed will struggle when they raise interest rates, they got to struggle in landing the economy softly without creating a recession. And many economists, including Larry Summers, argued that perhaps the soft landing is impossible because by raising interest rates, the Fed will create route in the stock market and that could spill over into the broader economy. We also got retail sales data today. And the conclusion was retail sales still increasing, the consumer still spending, but inflation is eating away from spending. Prices are too high and therefore consumers perhaps running out of stimulus running out of savings, maxing out the credit cards. You might have heard the news that the child tax credit payments, that's going to end. Therefore, the stimmies are gone now and we have to rely on organic spending. Is the consumer strong enough to do that organic spending? This is the test. Can the economy stand on its own feet or not without the support from the Fed? Inflation expectations sky high, specifically among the elderly over 60 years old are expecting higher inflation in the next three years. Yet regardless, we're seeing inflation expectations across all age groups reaching the highest readings in over a decade. And of course, inflation impacts the poor more than the rich, and therefore those with the lower incomes under 50,000 are expecting higher inflation in the next three years. But across all incomes, inflation expectations went higher. Likewise, across all regions, specifically regions with higher poverty rates, are expecting higher inflation in the next three years. The less educated, who happen to be the least earners, and the most impacted by inflation, of course, are also expecting higher inflation in the next three years. But inflation expectations moved higher across all education levels. And today we get the reading from the import price index. It is moving higher further adding to inflation expectations. Matter of fact, import prices climbed higher by about 11.7%. And this is the fastest rise in import prices in almost a decade. And of course, home prices are surging. We got the reading from the Home Builders Survey today, and they're also indicating higher home prices. And this is also contributing to higher inflation expectations. On top of that, before the FOMC announcement, and the press conference that followed, interest rate hikes probabilities moved a lot higher. And we had over 50% expectations that we will see the first hike as soon as May of next year. So the bottom line is, heading into the FOMC meeting, we were expecting Powell to become overly hawkish. And the expectations were, they're going to taper everything. They're going to announce tapering everything right now and set a framework for raising interest rates next year. Here's what we got. The Fed doubled the pace of tapering, but it did not end the purchasing programs. They will be through the tapering in March of next year. The question is, is this dovish or is this hawkish? Once again, the expectations were they're going to be really hawkish, tapering everything. The data is alarming, the CPI, the PPI, retail sales, inflation expectations, home prices. Yet the Fed only responded by doubling the pace of tapering, not ending purchasing programs. I would argue that this is dovish, and therefore the market rejoiced and reacted by pushing the indices higher. The algos reacted, they liked what they saw from Powell, specifically the decision of not ending tapering, because by not ending tapering, we don't even have to talk about interest rates. We're not going to revisit interest rates until we're through with the tapering. So this was a relief for the market. The decision, the action, was a lot better than expectations, and hence the reaction by the market. But there was one problem. The devil is always, always in the details. The action was dovish, no doubt about it, but the commentary, not so sure. The commentary was hawkish, I would argue, and it shows a confused man. Jerome Powell. He's not really sure what he wants to do. He knows he will upset the market sooner or later. He's just kicking the can down the road and using maximum employment as an excuse not to be too hawkish on paper. And this is of course all done to please the market. But 
The reporters did a good job today by pushing Pound to clarify what is maximum employment? What does that look like? What happens if inflation continues to rise higher and yet you have not achieved your maximum employment goals? This is important because they have uncovered the hawk hiding in the dove costume by asking these questions. You gotta pay attention here, otherwise you're gonna fall into traps. And so is the Fed, by the way. The Fed created the transitory trap, and now they're stuck in it. And Powell wants to dig another trap called the maximum employment trap. And if he's not wise enough to realize that he's not going to achieve maximum employment, inflation will go out of whack, out of control, and we will make the 1970s look like a blip on the radar. Let's start decoding Powell by the first question from Gianna Smilik of the New York Times. Why did Powell decide to become a hawk all of a sudden? Take a listen. Thank you. Let's go to Gina at the New York Times. Hey, Chair Powell. Thanks for taking our questions. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what prompted your recent pivot toward greater wariness around inflation. Sure. So I guess I would go back and, um, you know, it's been a continual process, really. Uh, um, in, inflation really popped up right in the in the in the late spring last year, and we had a view. It was very very widely held in the forecasting community that this would be temporary. It was quite narrow. Uh, you know, a, a limited number of of, uh, of factors were causing it, uh, and there was a decent amount of evidence to support that view that it would be temporary or transitory, as we said. Um, certainly, we had five months of declining month on month. Uh, monthly readings of inflation, but we didn't see much in the way of progress on labor supply or on other supply side issues. Then in September, I'd say after Labor Day, we started to see, it started to become clear that this was both larger in its effect on inflation and more persistent. And of course, I said so on, on many occasions. And one of the consequences of that is that we moved the taper forward. We moved the taper forward and we, and it's a much faster taper than, than had been planned. So We've been adapting. I've been saying we're adapting our policy. So come to your real question. Uh, we got the ECI reading on the eve of the um, November meeting. It was the Friday before the November meeting, and it was very high, 5.7% uh, reading for the Employment Compensation Index for the third quarter, not annualized, for the third quarter, just before the meeting. Uh, and I thought for a second there whether we, whether we, we should increase our taper, decided to go ahead with what we had, uh, what we had socialized. Uh, then right after that, we got the next Friday after the meeting, two days after the meeting, we got a very strong employment report and, uh, you know, revisions to prior readings and, and, and no increase in labor supply. And the Friday after that, we got the CPI, which was a very hot, a high reading. And I honestly, at that point, really decided that I thought we needed to, uh, we needed to look at, at speeding up the taper. And we went to work on that. So that, that's, that's really what happened. It was essentially... Uh, higher inflation and and faster turns out much faster progress in the labor market. Really, what's happening is the the unemployment rate is catching up. Seems to be catching up with a lot of the other readings of a tight labor market, six tenths over one cycle. So that's really what happened, and um, you know, widely supported in in the committee today, as you can see, unanimous vote. But beyond that, I think widely widely supported. The, you know, th this uh, this move. So if you're paying attention, what did he say? The reason behind the change in stance from Dove to Hawk is the fact that he got data indicating higher inflation than expectations, but that data came out when they've already made their mind and took the decision during the previous FOMC meeting. And therefore, that piece of data was not factored in during the last or previous FOMC meeting. But now, that piece of data is being factored in. And therefore, Powell changed his stance from Dove to Hawk. What did we get yesterday? What piece of data did we get yesterday? The answer is the PPI, the hottest producer price index reading in history. The assumption is Powell did not factor that reading in today's FOMC decision. What does that mean? That PPI reading that we got yesterday will be factored in in the next meeting in January. So you got to keep that in mind because you bet that PPI reading will elicit a reaction from the Fed a more hawkish reaction from the Fed. We did not get that hawkish reaction today, but we will get it in the next FOMC meeting. Continuing with Powell. If I could just follow up quickly, you noted that the ECI was one of the things that made you nervous, but you also said earlier that you don't see signs that wages are actually factoring into inflation yet. And I guess I wonder 
how you think about sort of the wage picture as as you're making these assessments. Right. So what I said, you, you quoted me correctly. It's 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 so far we don't see wages are not a big part of the high inflation story that we're seeing. As you look forward, let's assume that the goods economy does sort itself out and, and supply chains get working again. And maybe there's a rebalancing back to services and all, all that kinds of thing. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> What, what that leaves behind is the other things that can lead to persistent inflation. In particular, we don't see this yet, but what, if you had something where wages were persistently, real wages were persistently above productivity growth, that puts upward pressure on, uh, on, on firms and they raise prices. It would, it would take something that was persistent and material for that to happen, and we don't see that yet, but with the kind of hot labor market readings, uh, wages we're seeing, it's something that we're, that we're watching. And the other thing, of course, is, is rents, which are very important, uh, you know, owner's equivalent rent and rent. That's another thing which is very economically sensitive, unlike the, unlike the things that are causing the inflation now. This is economically sensitive, and so would be expected to move up. And so as, the, as some things go down, the question is, where will we be when we come out the other side of this? And we, we need to keep our eyes on those things. Okay, so he's bullshitting right now. You and I know that wage inflation is permanent inflation. You're not going to take wage hikes away from workers. And we heard during earnings calls from pretty much every corporation out there, every company out there, saying that wages are going higher and in response, we're hiking prices for consumers. So the spiral effect of wage inflation is already happening. And yesterday we talked about small businesses. They're hiking wages higher, but they're also hiking prices a lot higher than the increase of input costs from hiking wages. Then he talks about rents. And you and I know that the CPI downplays rent inflation. According to the CPI, rents went higher year over year by 3.9%. We all know that this is bullshit because rents are surging double digits across all cities in America. And even lagging cities like LA and New York, these rents are surging like crazy. Rents in Manhattan year over year last month went higher by over 20%. 2%. Regardless, the Fed has two mandates. Number one, price stability, meaning inflation. Mandate number two is maximum employment. He said that he became a hawk due to mandate number one because inflation is getting out of control and his mandate is price stability. Yet his action of not tapering everything right now was dovish in nature. Why? According to Powell, it's due to maximum employment, his second mandate. So the struggle for Powell right now is balancing the two mandates. One mandate says inflation is too high, you gotta be hawkish to achieve price stability. The other mandate says perhaps there is more juice here in the employment market. Perhaps you can get better employment numbers if you stay dovish for a little while. And this is the conflict that Powell is going through. The problem is, what if I told you we have already achieved maximum employment, Mr. Powell? So what is maximum employment, Mr. Powell? What do you mean by maximum employment? Because you've been beating on that drum for a while now. Here's Politico's Victoria Gaida, Goida, whatever her name is, apologies in advance, but she's asking the same question right here. What do you mean by maximum employment, Mr. Powell? Take a listen. Hi, Chair Powell. Um, I wanted to follow up on maximum employment. So, um, you know, the new framework was basically designed, as I understand it, so that um, there was a de-emphasis on guessing where inflation would pick up because of employment. And basically you were gonna wait until you saw the whites of the eyes of inflation and that's how you would kind of know that you reached maximum employment. So I'm wondering, you know, you've, um, you've talked a lot about the different ways that you might measure maximum employment, uh, but from what I understand, it, that's still basically the way that you know that you're there is inflation. So is that understanding correct? And um, how is, is are those signals likely to be clear right now, given that you have inflation that's caused by, you know, these supply chain disruptions that might also lead to, you know, inflation and wages and those sorts of things. So how do you sort of like tease out the signal of maximum employment? Okay. So let me start by saying that the inflation that we got was not at all the inflation we were looking for or talking about in the framework. This, this was, it really was a completely different thing. It was to do with you know, strong monetary policy and fiscal stimulus into an economy that was re recovering rapidly and in which 
there were these supply side barriers, which effectively led to, you know, uh, in certain parts of the economy, of what you might call a vertical supply curve. So, you know, uh, automobile purchases are very interest rate sensitive, uh, and you would think demand would drive up the, the, the quantity of cars, but it can't because they don't have semiconductors. So Yeah, I wonder why they don't have semiconductors, Mr. Powell. Who and what was the reason behind pushing demand out of whack to cause the supply chain shortages? Because they tell you it's the virus, right? The virus causing all these ships and all these delays. Bullshit. We have all of these shortages because we have unprecedented demand. Why do we have such demand right now? The answer is the cocaine. The loose money out of thin air in the form of stimmies and form of injections in the market. That was the reason behind the absurd demand causing all of these shortages. You, Mr. Powell, were the reason behind the surge in demand. Continuing. So that was a very different uh, uh, kind of inflation. This is not the inflation we were looking for under our framework at all. It's nothing to do with our framework. And our the way we've approached it is really nothing to do with our, our framework. But come, come to maximum employment, which is which is really your question, how do you know? So I, th I think you look at, at you know, prices and quantities. When you, if you want to look at maximum employment, you look at prices and quantities, and the main price you look at is wages. It's one of the things you look at. And, um, you know, it's uh, – so I mentioned a number of the things. You could get to 20 if you wanted to uh, easily, but labor force participation, uh, the unemployment rate, different age groups of, you know, prime age labor force participation in particular gets a lot of focus – the jolts data get a lot of focus, um, and wages. That's that's really one of the great signals. The quits rate is another one. Uh, the quits rate is is really one of the very best indicators, according to a lot of labor economists, because it people quit because they feel like they can get a better job. And there's you know record amounts, historically high levels of that going on, suggesting again that you've got a very tight labor market. Um, so on wages, that's the price indicator we we look at. Uh, to tell us, along with all the other data, whether we're whether we're, we have labor market conditions that are consistent with maximum employment, uh, and so that's that's how we think about it. Okay, so you can see how confused he is. He doesn't even know what the definition of maximum employment is. He brings out wages. Well, wages are surging out of whack, but inflation is also surging out of whack, and that is canceling all wage gains. That's number one. So when he says. Oh, wage gains is the parameter for maximum employment. Well, we're seeing wage gains across the board, sky high, to the point where wage increases are causing spiraling effect, ripple effects, causing price increases across the board in consumers, and that inflation in turn is canceling wage gains. So if that is the parameter you want to use, Mr. Powell, for maximum employment, well, guess what? We have already reached maximum wages. You have companies voluntarily raising the minimum wage above 15 bucks an hour to attract workers. We have companies of fast food restaurants giving away iPads and iPhones, and they cannot find workers. We have already reached maximum employment if the definition of maximum employment means higher wages. Then he uses jolts and job openings as a parameter for maximum employment. Well, guess what? We have the highest job openings in history. Over 11 million jobs open right now, and we cannot find workers to fill these jobs. So again, if the definition of maximum employment is higher job openings, we're already there, Mr. Powell. And then he says job quits. If that is the parameter for maximum employment, well, guess what? Last month, we had over 4 million Americans quitting their jobs. One of the highest readings on record. So if you want to use that parameter as a definition for maximum employment, guess what? We're already there, Mr. Powell. What else? What else left here? Oh, the labor participation rate, he says. To reach maximum employment, we need higher labor participation rate, right? Well, perhaps that is not achievable, Mr. Powell. And ladies and gentlemen, guess what? He already knows that. Jerome Powell already knows that a higher participation rate or higher labor participation rate is not realistic right now. Not going to happen. And here's the part where the hawk comes out. Pay attention now. What if the definition of maximum employment is a higher labor participation rate? The main question is, how long will that take? Assuming it's possible, of course. And will the Fed continue to wait until that happens while inflation continues to surge out of whack? Here comes the hawk. Take a listen. But the, 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 one of the complications is that, again, we've got to make policy in real time. So how do we think about that? Do we, if we think we can make labor, you know, participation might move up. If we, let's say we knew that it would start to move up in two years, would we wait two years or when inflation is running way above target? Probably not. You know, so you have to make 
an assessment that what's max, what is the level of maximum employment that is consistent with price stability in real time is, is one way to think about it. In other words, what Powell is saying is, how do I balance the two mandates? Am I going to wait for maximum employment to happen while the other mandate of price stability gets out of control and inflation continues to surge higher and higher and higher? What if I told you that maximum employment will happen two years from now? In the meantime, are we going to continue to wait and do nothing when it comes to the other mandate of price stability? Powell is contradicting himself here, or perhaps slipping into hawk mode by saying, I'm not going to wait till maximum employment. If inflation continues to get out of control, I am raising interest rates because the definition of maximum employment is fluid, but the definition of inflation is not fluid. Just to kind of follow up on that for a second, if, if you do raise interest rates next year, and um, you know, it's you're not certain whether you're at maximum employment. I mean, are, are you all going to point when you raise interest rates? Are you going to point to ways in which the labor market could still improve? Yes, I mean, I, 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 absolutely. I, I think. Well, it, whether or not we say whether or not we we say we're at conditions, labor market conditions consistent with with maximum employment next year, we would all be open, and I think expect over time that the level of maximum employment that's consistent with price stability would increase further over time, for example, through increasing participation. So I, we would certainly, we, we would not in any way want to foreclose the idea that the labor market can get even better. But again, with inflation as high as it is, we, we have to make policy in real time. We've got to make that assessment in real time. So again, you're hearing the hawk right now. He cannot wait. He cannot afford to wait to raise interest rates. And he is confused. You can see a confused man here who's not sure what to do, who's facing a massive conflict with the two mandates. He continues to be accommodative, and this is causing higher inflation. The price stability mandate says you should act right now by raising interest rates. The other mandate, maximum employment, I would argue that we are already at maximum employment. But according to Powell, that's not going to happen until labor participation rates improve. In balancing the two, Powell reasserted the same narrative, that he's not going to wait till maximum employment to happen. He will act according to the first mandate, which is inflation and price stability. This is hawkish, folks. This is not dovish. And then, of course, he goes into the fantasy by saying, yeah, we're going to raise interest rates. We're not going to wait for maximum employment. We're going to raise interest rates if inflation gets out of whack. But we hope that the labor participation rate will increase over time. This is a fantasy, a wishful thinking, of course. The moment he starts to raise interest rates, and now that he's waiting at least till March before he does that, inflation will get out of whack and raising interest rates will have to be more aggressive. This will crash the stock market. And by crashing the stock market, companies will respond by de-risking. De-risking mean lowering their expenses. The highest expense that corporations have right now is labor cost, and therefore they're going to get rid of workers, and hence the maximum employment trap. Whether you like it or not, Mr. Powell, the economy will start losing jobs sooner or later, the moment you start raising interest rates. You got two choices here, Mr. Powell. Number one, respond to inflation by raising interest rates, and you're going to threaten by doing that, crashing the market, and therefore destroying the progress in the unemployment front. Choice number two, do nothing and wait for the unemployment front to continue to improve while risking inflation rising higher and higher and higher. In essence, option number two will depend on the transitory nature of inflation, which you now retired. You now say that inflation is not transitory. What does that mean? You gotta respond to inflation. Again, what does that mean? Option number one. You're gonna raise interest rates sooner or later. That's gonna crash the market. It's gonna crash the economy. It's going to cause unemployment, and that's that. The remedy for this inflation is a recession, whether you like it or not. And here's Powell admitting that the labor participation rate might not improve. Matter of fact, perhaps the factors determining the labor participation rate are not under control of the Fed. There are exogenous factors controlling the labor participation rate. Take a listen. Thank you. We'll go to Olivia from Bloomberg. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Powell, and thank you for taking our questions. I wanted to follow up on some of your earlier comments about labor force participation, and I wondered what do you think needs to change in the economy to kind of get a meaningful recovery in labor force participation, and also whether running the economy hot, like in the last expansion, is one way of doing that? Well, the labor market is, by so many measures, hotter than it ever ran in the last uh, uh, 
in the last expansion, if you think about it, you know, the, the ratio of job openings, for example, to, uh, to, un, to vacancies is at all time highs, quits, the, the wages, all those things are, 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 are even hotter. Um, but what would it take for labor force participation to move up more? Um, you know, that's a, that really, why is it low is the question. So there, there, there are a bunch of answers and all of them probably have some, uh, you know, some validity. Part, part of it will be that people, uh, for certain people, they don't want to go back in the labor force because either they're medically vulnerable or they're not comfortable uh, going back uh, while COVID is still everywhere. That's one thing. The, the, the lack of availability of child care it made for caretakers is certainly part of it, not just for children, but for, for older people. Um, it has been pointed out by many that the stock market is high, people's portfolios are stronger. They may, they may go back to being a one income rather than a two income family. The same thing with, with people's houses. People buy a, a, they have a mortgage and the, you know, with, with leverage and the house price increases, the equity they have in their home might have doubled and they might make, reach the same conclusion. So there are, and, and people have savings on their balance sheet because of forced savings that because they couldn't spend on travel and things like that and also because of um, you know, because of government transfers. So for all of those reasons, and it's hard to know exactly the part each of them plays, we, we, have, a, we have a situation where we've had a shock to labor force participation that is not unwinding as quickly as, as many has expected. And uh, people, in effect, a good part of it is voluntary. It, it, you know, people, and, and this is how they want to maximize their welfare, and that's, that's, that's their, certainly their choice. In other cases, it's something that will abate very quickly if, if and when the pandemic gets under control. And the longer the pandemic goes on, you know, maybe the less likely that people will come back because they're, uh, you know, they get used to their new life and they lose contact with their old jobs. That's, that's what the evidence would say. So it's a range of things. Um, it, it isn't that the, the economy lacks stimulus. You know, usually in every other uh, expansion, it's that there aren't enough jobs and people can't find jobs. And, you know, we're stimulating demand and trying to get demand to come up. That's not the problem here. The, the problem is, is a supply side problem, which um, what it would take to work it out, I think it's going to be time. And, and the number one thing it would, to, would really be to, to have the pandemic get under control. That's what everyone would really like to see. What does the labor force, what does the labor market look like in a world without COVID? That would be the thing that, uh, that we'd really like to see. But, but uh, you know, it, it doesn't look like that's coming anytime soon. So Perel admits that more stimulus from the Fed will not impact the labor participation rate because the labor participation rate is now being impacted by pandemic-related factors of people retiring, moms staying at home, people quitting jobs relying on one income rather than two, yada, yada, yada. Uh, we're not going to know what the economy looks like regarding the labor participation rate in a post-pandemic world, and the reason is we're still facing the pandemic. In other words, Powell just admitted that the labor participation rate should not be in the formula of determining maximum employment. And if that is the case, and if what determines maximum employment is wages, job openings, quits, then we are already at maximum employment, Mr. Powell. And here is Nick from the Wall Street Journal, and he's going to seal the deal once and for all. Take a listen. Uh, Chair Powell, in March, you answered a question about maximum employment like this. You said 4% would be a nice unemployment rate to get to, but it'll take more than that to get to maximum employment. More recently, you have hinted at a possible distinction between the level of maximum employment that's achievable in the short run versus in the long run. Has your view of the level of maximum employment changed this year? And if so, how? And how close is the economy right now to your judgment of the short run level of maximum employment? Thank you. Right, so the, uh, you know, the thing is, we're not going back to the same economy we had in February of 2020. Uh, and I think early on, that was the sense was that, that that's where we were headed. The post pandemic labor market uh, and the economy in general will be different. And um, the maximum level of employment that's consistent with, with price stability evolves over time within, a, within a, a business cycle and over, over a longer period, in part reflecting um, evolution of the factors that, that affect labor supply, including those related to the pandemic. Uh, so I would say, look, we're, we're, we're at 4.2 percent now, and it's been, the unemployment rate has been dropping very quickly. So we're already in the vicinity of 4 percent. Um, the, the way in which the uh, – which the, the important 
metric that has been disappointing, really, has been labor per, labor force participation, of course, where uh, we had widely thought, I had certainly thought that uh, it, last fall, as um, unemployment insurance ran off, as vaccinations increased, as schools reopened, that we would see a significant uh, surge, if you will, or at least a surge in, uh, in labor force participation. So we've begun to see some improvement. We were certainly welcome the two-tenths improvement that we got in the November report. But I, I do think uh, that uh, it's, it feels likely now that the return to higher participation is going to take longer. And in fact, that's, that's been the pattern in past cycles, that labor force participation has tended to recover in the wake of a strong recovery in unemployment, which is what we're getting right now. So <clears throat> you, it could well have been that this cycle was different because of the short nature of it and the very strong, uh, the number of job openings, for example, you would have thought that that would have pulled people back in. But really, it's the pandemic, it's a range of factors, but the reality is we don't have a strong labor force participation recovery yet, and we may not have it for some time. At the same time, we have to make policy now and uh, inflation is, is well above target. So this is something we need to take into, uh, take into account. Here he is again, saying we cannot wait. We cannot wait when inflation is surging out of whack. I have to respond to the first mandate. This is as hawkish as you can get, and it gets even better. If I could, if I could follow up, you, you've talked recently about risk management. And so does that mean that the committee might feel compelled to raise interest rates before you're convinced that you've achieved the, the employment uh, test in your forward guidance? So this is, this is not at all a decision that the committee has made, uh, but you're really asking a question about how our framework works. And yes, there is a, there's a provision, uh, it, it used to be called the balanced approach provision, that says in effect that uh, in, in situations in which uh, the pursuit of the maximum employment goal and the price stability goal are not complementary. Uh, we have to take account of the distance from the goal and, and the speed at which we're approaching it. And so that, that is in effect uh, an off-ramp which could, in, in, in concept, uh, be taken. And it's in, our, it's in our framework. It's been in our framework a long time. I've talked about it on a number of occasions. It, it, it is a, a, a provision that would enable us to, in this case, because of high inflation, move before achieving maximum employment. Now, we're, as I said, we're making rapid progress toward maxim, maximum employment in my, in my thinking, in my opinion, and I don't at all know that we will, that, that we'll have to invoke that, uh, that paragraph. But just as a, as a factual matter, that is part of our framework and, and has been really for a very long time. Boom, that seals the deal. Powell says, I gotta balance the two mandates. And if it's gonna take a long time till maximum employment, on the other hand, inflation continuing to surge out of whack, I'm gonna have to take action. We have a provision at the Fed that says, you know what? If you have one mandate that's getting out of control, you gotta take action to control that mandate, to respond to that mandate, even if it impacts the other mandate negatively. Folks, this is as hawkish as you can get. And therefore I say, the action was dovish, the commentary was hawkish. So why didn't Powell take action today? Why didn't he taper everything today and perhaps announced interest rates hikes coming out next year? Why? Here's Steve Leisman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is, if, it's, it's often said that monetary policy has long and variable lags. Uh, how does continuing to buy assets now, even though it's at a slower pace, uh, address the current inflation problem? Won't the impact of today's changes uh, not really have any impact for six months or a year down the road on the current inflation problem? And aren't you actually lengthening that time by continuing to buy assets such that it could be not until the long and variable lag after you end purchases sometime in March? that you'll start to have any impact on the inflation problem. So on uh, the first part of your question, which is why not stop purchasing now, I would just say this. We, we've learned that we're in dealing with balance sheet issues. We've learned that it's best to take a careful sort of methodical approach to make adjustments. Uh, markets can be sensitive to it. And we thought that this was, this was a doubling of the speed. We'll, we're basically two meetings away now from, from finishing the taper, and we thought that was the appropriate way to go. Uh, so we announced it, and that's that's what will happen. Um, you know, the question of long and variable lags is, is an interesting one. That's that's Milton Friedman's famous statement, and um, 
I do think that uh, in this world where everything is, where the global financial connect, uh, markets are connected together, uh, financial conditions can change very quickly. And my own sense is that they get into uh, financial conditions affect the economy fairly rapidly, uh, longer than the traditional thought of, you know, a year or 18 months, le shorter than that, rather. Um, but uh, in addition, when we communicate about what we're going to do, uh, the markets move immediately to that. So f financial conditions are changing uh, to reflect, uh, you know, the, 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 the forecast that we made and it basically which was, I think, fairly in line with what markets were expecting. But uh, financial conditions don't wait to change until, until things actually happen. They, they, they change on the expectation of things happening. So I don't think it's a question of, uh, uh, of having to wait. So Powell is bullshitting, of course. We know that the Fed's actions are lagging, meaning if the Fed takes action today, it's going to lag until we see the result. There is a lag, six months to a year. And even Neil Kashkari, the demon from Minneapolis, already admitted that on TV, that there is a lag. But Powell says this time is different and uh, evident of the <laughs> reaction of the stock market. Every time I make a decision, the stock market reacts right away. And therefore, there is no lag. What a delusional moron. Really? You're taking the algo's reaction as an excuse to say that there is no lag in Fed's actions and the impact on the economy? Wow. It is still amazing to me that this guy, this clueless madman, is the head of the Fed. He has absolutely no clue what he's doing. But here's the important take for us market participants. Take a listen. Can I just follow up uh, in thinking about having to wait? Uh, is it still the policy or the position of the committee that you will not raise rates until the taper is complete. Thank you. Yes, I, the, the sense of that, of course, being that um, buying assets is adding accommodation and raising rates is, is removing accommodation. Uh, since we're two meetings away from completing the taper, assuming things go as, as expected, um, I think if we wanted to lift off before then, uh, then, then what we'd, you would stop the taper potentially sooner. But that's not something I expect to happen. But uh, I, I, do, I do not think it would be appropriate, and we don't, we don't find ourselves in a situation where we, where we might have to uh, raise rates while, the, while, while, we, while we're still purchasing assets. So here it is. Powell says we're not going to raise interest rates until we're finished with tapering. And tapering will not be through until March. What does that mean? We can set our expectations right now that interest rates will not go higher until March. What does that mean? Can we party and have a Santa rally until March? Maybe. But you got to be careful here. You got to be selective. We'll talk in a second. But we have to go back to Powell. And the last question by Mike from Bloomberg. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um... The median forecast for inflation in this month's uh, or this meeting's uh, economic projections has been revised up significantly for 2021, but barely moved for 2022 and 2023. Uh, you've said you expect inflation to fall significantly. Is that because you're going to raise interest rates? or because the virus is going to fade and the effects are going to fade? In other words, is it a question of when, not if you raise interest rates? And does it suggest that maybe your critics are correct and you might be afraid you're behind the curve? So actually, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the SEP here and, and the median forecasts for core and headline inflation did move up by, by four tenths each. So th that's a significant. Uh, you know, in an SCP, that's a pretty significant move up. Um, you know, it's it's based on on both of those things, I suppose. Um, I, I do think uh, th there's a broad expectation among forecasters, including our own, that the that the bottlenecks will alleviate sometime over the course of this year. If you look at look at where blue chip forecasts are. Okay, so I'm going to fast forward here because Jerome Powell is bullshitting. The question was clear. Are you saying that inflation will go down next year because you will raise interest rates higher? You and I know that raising interest rates higher is deflationary in nature because it crashes the equities market, it crashes inflation expectations, yada, yada, yada. The question was, Crystal clear. But Jerome Powell was weaseling his way around, not answering the question at all. Let's go to Michael Derby, The Wall Street Journal.
Yeah, thank you for taking my uh, question. And look at Mike's face. He's like, yeah, that didn't answer my question at all. That was way off. Not even close. Absolute gibberish. But here's the take, folks. The action was dovish. The expectations were they're going to taper everything right now today. It didn't happen. They're doubling the pace, but that's going to take all the way to the marsh, meaning raising interest rates will not happen until after marsh. We already knew that. So on paper, the action is dovish, and thus the market reaction, the orgy. The problem is the devil is in the details, always. And the details, the commentary is hawkish. The man is saying... Look, I can't wait for maximum employment here. I gotta act if inflation continues to rise higher. To me, that's not dovish. That's hawkish. So whatever pops we're getting in the market right now, be able to distinguish between what's transitory pop and what is a sustainable pop. Because all what we got today is kicking the can down the road. He's gonna raise interest rates sooner or later. I know some of you guys continue to say, but what about the debt? What about the zombie companies? Yeah, what about them? They're gonna crash. But he's not gonna jack interest rates higher by a million points right away. It's a gradual increase in interest rates. But the market reacts based on future expectations and if this is the framework for the fed to continue to raise interest rates higher not once not twice but three times next year and who knows maybe more in the following year because inflation is not going to cool down folks i assure you i guarantee you inflation might take a dent in december due to the you know the variant denting oil prices down but as i showed you yesterday in last night videos in the 70s example the source of inflation is always the monetary policy and so long as they're not raising interest rates higher inflation will come back bigger and stronger and powell says if that is the case i am raising interest rates and i don't give a shit about maximum employment anymore this is hawkish so what does that mean certain pops and oversold names are warranted for example robin hood data dog the ticker net cloud fair all of these names, CrowdStrike, all of these names popped higher, significantly higher today after the FOMC decision. That was bound to happen either way. These names were severely oversold. Yes, we saw a rally in Apple and Tesla and other names, NVIDIA, etc. Will that be sustainable? That depends. You gotta pick your names specifically. Nothing changed here. We're just kicking the can down the road. So the high multiple names, the no revenue, no profit kind of names, you gotta avoid them. You cannot buy the dip in these names. However, inflationary themes will have more of a sustainable bounce, a sustainable rally. These are the kind of names you want to buy the dip at. Case in point, commodities and specifically oil, because energy prices will continue to rise higher. Why? We will look at the supply dynamic. Who controls the supply of oil? The answer is the Jerome Powell of oil, meaning the Saudi oil minister. The Saudi oil minister came out over the weekend and he said, I warn everybody from shorting oil because if you short oil and prices go down, I'm going to cut the supply. I got the power over supply and I can play with that supply all I want, up or down. If you're going to crush prices artificially, well, guess what? I'm going to cut the supply and push these prices higher again. The threat for oil prices was not the supply, and therefore the release of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve was misguided at best. The threat for oil prices is from the demand side. Who controls the demand side for oil? The answer is the actual Jerome Powell and the little Pokemon variant, of course. Well, guess what? Jerome Powell says, I'm not going to raise interest rates until I'm done tapering. And that's not going to happen until March. What about the Pokemon? Well, we have Dr. Fauci who came out today and said, you know what? We don't need a new jab for the thing. So what do you have now in the oil market? You have support from the supply side. The Saudi oil minister says, if you buy oil, I got your back. And now Jerome Powell says, I'm not raising interest rates right now. And therefore, don't worry about the demand. The fact that the thing doesn't require a new jab that also says go ahead buy oil the demand will not be dented for now and you get the support from the supply side so i see a rebound in oil as more sustainable than data dog or robin hood or ark invest or any high multiple high growth names these are going to flush down sooner or later again because the fed will raise interest rates sooner or later you could say the same thing about oil. Well, what about oil, bro? Because the fed is going to raise interest rates sooner or later anyways for now for now until marsh Money has to go somewhere. Yes, it could chase the high mania names again. But to me, a more rational bounce will be in oil and commodities because you have the support from the supply side. 
and no pressure from the demand side at least until March. Bottom line is, the pump that we got by the end of the day perhaps was short covering certain panicking that the Fed did not taper everything right away. But as we digest what Jerome Powell said, I think the market will be surprised that he was actually hawkish underneath it all. And the market is not going to like that. So keep your eyes open. If you're blind, if you're chasing every move, every tick higher, every tick down, you're going to get smoked. Anyhow, folks, we gotta move on here. Decoding the son of a bitch took a lot of time. And I'm already recording this too late, so let's move on and skip to the charts analysis and wrap it up. And if you got any complaints about that, please email our complaints department. They'll take care of you. Anyhow, we're moving on to the charts analysis with the SPY 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? The chart solidified the support of 461. So we have a double bottom formation for now. And of course, the orgy happened right away after the FOMC decision, but we moved from oversold to overbought right away, really fast. What does that mean? In all likelihood, we're going to move down to revisit 466 and a half as support and take it from there. I think there was a lot of knee jerk reactions today that will reverse. I'm not saying that the market will reverse because this is a massive reversal to the upside. I'm not sure we're going to see the reversal of the reversal because Powell gave the green light for certain corners of the stock market to rally, a so called Santa rally. But you got to be careful here. I believe that the market will digest the commentary. And they will realize that Powell came out actually hawkish. And certain names might bounce, but these bounces will fade away quickly. So I'm looking at 466 for support, a retest, I will take it from there. And here is a daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY. Look at the battle that's going on from a MACD perspective. We crossed higher creating green impressions on the histogram. Then we gave that away right away, creating a red impression on the histogram. Today, we bounced higher again, erasing the move from yesterday. And now the momentum indicators are curling higher once again. We're trading above 4,657 once again. So Powell, for now, technically speaking, came to rescue the bulls because the bears were lurking around and they were gaining significant advantage. And then came Powell to the rescue and gave that massive pump higher. The shorts covered, the algos pumped higher, now it comes in the laps of bulls. Are they going to follow up and buy? Or are they just going to stay there? Because last time around when we saw the pump by algos and the options manipulation, yada, yada, yada. The market consolidated sideways and the bulls did not buy. And therefore the market flushed down. Here we have round two. Another pump. Will the bulls follow and start to buy the market now that they have the assurances from Powell and the anticipation of the so-called Santa Ratty? If that happens, the market rallies to all-time highs. If not, we flush down again. So the follow-up is extremely important here. But the bulls have turned the table for now, technically speaking. What about the cues? What's going on here? Again, a double bottom, just like we saw with SPY. So you can see the traces of the algorithmic reaction right away. Where did we stop? exactly at 397 the resistance so what happens from here we went from oversold to overbought in all likelihood we're gonna start weak here giving away some of those gains and we'll take it from there if the queues manages to climb above 397 by tomorrow then you know for sure the bulls gain full advantage of the market and we will have the so-called Santa rally, the so-called end of the year rally, doesn't matter to me. But it's going to be an inclusive rally here. Unfortunately for certain names, that's going to fade away quickly. And the reason is, all what Pal did is kicking the can down the road. That's all there is. So we get, we got to be selective here and careful in buying the dip. Buy the strong, the names that did not get hit to begin with. Those are the names within the NASDAQ that are going to continue to perform good. What about the NASDAQ, the daily chart for the continuous contract? Again, erasing the move from yesterday. Yet the momentum indicators did not cross the positive territory yet. That could happen any day, could happen by tomorrow. The volume moved higher on the buying side. We're now trading above 15,976 once again. And therefore, the bulls turned the table here. And they're gaining the advantage. The bears ate a nice pie, at least for now courtesy of Jerome Powell. And what about the IWM, the Russell 2000? What's going on here? It pierced below 213, which was a dangerous place to be for the IWM. But thank you to Powell and the algos and the shorts covering, the IWM popped higher. And now we're facing the resistance of 218 once again. Now, is this behavior bullish or bearish? The answer is, it is bullish. 
at least for now, because the chart regained 213 as support, and it is eyeing 218 for support. It's going to be a tough one. It might take a little while, but climbing above 218 will solidify that we have a bottom for now. 213 is solid, at least for now. And what about the Dixie, the dollar index? What's going on here? It popped higher initially after the decision, but it reversed all of these gains and started to flush down again. So far, there is no decisive move by the Dixie until and unless either it trades below 96 and that we know that the dollar is going to flush down and we will trade accordingly. If the dollar goes down, this will be good for gold good for oil good for copper if the dollar trades above 97 then we know that the dollar is bullish for now and a higher dollar is not very good for commodities and here it is the chart of gold what's going on here the obvious is the technical formation is bearish we have a bear flag however the behavioral element of the chart is different the chart pierced below 1763 and bounced back right away is this behavior within itself bullish or bearish the answer is it is bullish look at the macd indicator it is gaining steam. My hunch is it is just a matter of time before gold catches a bit. I could be wrong, but I kind of miss the Peter Schiff memes with the laser beam eyes. I want to bring those back. So let's have a gold rally here, please. Anyhow, moving on to the 10 year yield, what's going on here in this chart? Notice that there is no massive reaction in the bond market, by the way. The stock market had a massive orgy, not in the bond market. The bond market is not sure yet what to make of Powell. Yields moved initially higher, but who knows if they're going to keep these gains or not. When I look at the MACD and the RSI, the chart is on the side of bulls, meaning the 10-year yield bulls, assuming that the yields will move higher and close the week above 1.5%. Here's the problem though. Notice that technology, the cues, the high multiple names, were rallying higher when yields were moving higher. As of late, of course, not always, but as of late, when the TLT rallies and the 10-year yield moves down, we see massive sell-offs in technology and the queues in general. Why? Because the bond market says the forecast for growth is down because Powell is going to taper and by tapering and raising interest rates, he's going to push the economy into a recession, into a tightening mode, and the tightening Fed is not good for high multiple and high growth stocks. But here is the tech trap. The Nasdaq might rally higher with the high multiple names in charge. As the 10-year yield moves higher, assuming that Powell is dovish for now at least, the prospects of growth are not dented at least for now because Powell is not going to raise interest rates until March. What happens, let's say, if yields in the 10-year move all the way higher to 1.6, 1.7 once again? Then we're going to revisit the argument of yields are moving higher and this is going to dent the multiples for these high multiple names in the technology sector of the market. So it is a lose-lose situation here for technology in the Nasdaq in my opinion. If yields get crushed on the 10 year, that means the Fed is becoming too aggressive and tightening too much. This is not good for the high multiple names in technology. If he doesn't, and the prospect of growth moves higher, pushing the 10 year yield higher to 1.6, 1.7, then we're going to face the same argument that yields are too high and that's going to cut multiples in technology, thus the lose-lose situation. The sweet spot for technology and high multiple names, the software kind of names, the ARK invest kind of names, if yields Yields of the 10 year consolidate from this point on, not popping higher and not crashing down, just consolidating slowly but surely. At least till the end of the year, this will be very good for technology and the ARK Invest kind of names. And here it is, the TLT, what's going on here? Not trading below 149 yet, keyword yet. We'll see how it closes by the end of the week. Closing below 149 will solidify the argument that the TLT will go down and yields will pop higher. What about the VIX 4 hours chart? What's going on here? The MACD is already producing green impressions of the histogram, but it is not trading in positive territory yet. And it is already curling down. It appears that it's going to lose the momentum, producing red impressions in the histogram once again. If that happens, then the VIX will lose 20 as support for sure, and the SPY will reach higher highs. Too early to say, but if the VIX closes the week above 20, that the bears will still have a glimpse of hope here, that the market will continue to be in correction mode till the end of the year, and thus no Santa rally. So this is important. It's an important chart to watch anyways, but specifically now, because we're watching the weekly closing. Is it going to be above 20 or below 20? Above 20 favors the bears, below 20 when he favors the bulls. What about Apple, a daily chart? What's going on here? Popping higher after the FOMC decision right away, we saw a lot of call options buying for 175, 177 and a half, even 180. This is of course for the expiration date of this Friday. So what happens here? The psychology says they wanted to touch the 3 trillion mark. They wanted to see in television or CNBC, the breaking news, the banner, Apple reaches 3 trillion valuation. This is the psychological goal 
from the get-go. Now, they failed to reach that objective earlier in the week. My hunch is they're going to give it another shot. And perhaps they will be successful this time around. And we will hear the headline, Apple trading at $3 trillion, the most valuable company on the planet, yada, yada, yada. But I want to see how Apple trades at that moment, at that level. We have the previous resistance right now at 182.13, but the $3 trillion mark at 182.5. I want to see how it trades at that point and then decide whether to add to my put options position on Apple or not. Or just abandon that trade altogether. It depends. If we get to 3 trillion and we see a sell off right away, then we'll see the pump and dump. And therefore, I'm going to add to my position, averaging down. But if Apple reaches 3 trillion and it stays there, gaining momentum, then in all likelihood, I have to abandon the trade because we will have higher highs. And you'll be able to spot that right away from the options market activities. If they continue to roll up 180, 185, 200, you're going to be able to spot that right away and make your decisions accordingly. What about the chart for Tesla, the souffle daily chart? What's going on here? Moving a little higher today, as the rest of the market, of course. Are we getting oversold at this point? Not really. There are some oversold indicators that could initiate a pop. The problem is the momentum has been lost in this chart. When we switch the weekly chart, for example, look at where the MACD is trading. It's about to cross the negative territory. Likewise, the RSI is already in negative divergence. What does that mean? Let's say Tesla pops higher tomorrow and for the reminder of the week. The oversold pop, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter to me. That's going to fade away quickly. And the reason is the weekly charts remain bearish. Not just on Tesla, by the way. Look at Datadog and all of these names that popped higher today. The weekly charts not so hot so moving on to tulips what's going on here it is starting to look a little better here the momentum indicators are about to cross to positive readings we have what it appears to be a saucer bottoming formation for now the problem is it is a saucer bottoming formation within a bear flag what does that mean i don't have the assurance that i need to hop in and buy btc right now i'm gonna wait either flush down to 42,000, and retest that support hence the double bottom or reclimbing 53,200 for support and confirming that level as support then i'm interested but for now we are in no man's land here if you want to take the risk if your risk tolerance is high i get it you have supportive arguments on your side to pull the trigger and buy btc see right now you have the momentum indicators you have the saucer bottoming formation you have pal not being as hawkish as we anticipated giving you until march to party but i'm not gonna do it until 53,200 is supportive or 42,000. lastly what about amc what's going on here in a plan moving a little higher today but folks you gotta close above 26 by the end of the week you got two days now two days either you're gonna close above 26 or you're dead you're done i'm still on your side i know how this move is gonna end but until then i'm still on your side and for amc to move higher you gotta close above 26 and that will take a combination of buying the stock and call options you gotta continue to do both anyhow moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow we have the initial jobless claims for the week and this reading will be important perhaps more important than usual and the reason is pal insists the maximum employment is still important and still relevant and hence good news in the employment front will be bad news for the stock market why if we're having less unemployment claims and perhaps we get a reading that says unemployment claims hit the lowest reading since the beginning of the pandemic is this good news for the market or bad news the answer is it is bad news for the market because it indicates that we're closer to maximum employment and hence closer to raising interest rates. Then we have building permits and housing starts. On top of that, we have the Philly Manufacturing Index, the Industrial Production Index, and most importantly, the Manufacturing and Services PMIs. All of these will be important, but all eyes will be on the unemployment claims because Powell made that number extra important. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow.